portrait painter M.W. Hopkins Lima will pursue his profession in this place for a short time. Ladies and gentlemen are respectfully invited to call at his room and examine specimens of his work. This was how these early folk artists in America advertised their arrival in the local press or in handbills. They were called limmers to distinguish them from painters with an academic training. Their only training was in sign writing, coach building or house painting and they went on from there to portrait painting, to painting the houses, the farms and the animals of their patrons. They also painted what they called fancy pictures, which included everything not directly connected with the family, patriotic images, for example, which were always in demand. Limming was the make-do art of a people who had scarcely any professional artists outside the big towns. But it's a make-do art whose spontaneous simplicity of design makes an immediate impact. It grew out of sign painting and it underlined for the early Americans their sense of being American, their strong family feeling, their yearning for status, their pride in their possessions. It was a heraldry for nonconformists, a, a sort of coat of arms for the ordinary man. All likenesses are warranted correct and satisfactory or no charge will be made. This sort of advertisement was just so much sales talk, of course, and in fact the human face in these folk portraits is always treated in a standard way. The eyes are always wide open, the mouth always closed, though it can be thin or full, the nose long or short, the eyes close together or far apart. There was no attempt to catch an expression or a mood. The people, even the children, who stare out at us so boldly from these portraits were brought up to be forthright, sober and purposeful, and it was more important to them to possess images which pointed up these virtues than to be confronted by portraits which explored the subtleties of personality. They needed only to be able to identify themselves with the paintings, to tell it was them, and there were various ways in which the limmers provided proof of identity. They would reproduce a familiar furniture, a uniform, a picture on the wall. The woman painted in her best bonnet and dress, which only came out on big occasions. A man accompanied by symbols of his trade or profession, the merchant with his ledgers, for instance. This anonymous painting of a fireman is an unusually elaborate example. He's wearing his full regalia, his helmet beside him, and beyond the curtain, a vivid little scene of the kind he had to deal with. The kind of money these folk artists got didn't allow them to indulge in experiments which might not come off. The poses were standard and pretty stiff at that. Charges ranged from as little as a dollar for a profile and three dollars for a front view to a top figure of twenty-five dollars if the sitter wanted light and shade or particularly elaborate dress and the artist had a reputation for it. Pride of ownership led many people to have portraits made of their homes, farms or businesses as well as of themselves. And when the travelling painters recorded a country scene, they catalogued its main features with the same simple assurance that they brought to their human portraits.
farm of Mr. E. R. Jones of Dodgeville, Wisconsin, has an air of piety, as if every day in Dodgeville was a Sunday. Mr. Tuttle's livery stables painted in 1870. Mr. Tuttle is obviously proud of his weather vane, so the fact that it's out of scale doesn't necessarily reflect on the artist's skill. Leadham Farm, described on the back, a May morning view of the farm and stock of David Leadham of Newtown, Bucks County, with himself, wife, father, mother, brothers, sisters and nephew. This masterpiece of American painting has a cool, sharp, early morning magic and must be one of the most beautiful stock inventories ever made. Children were often painted at reduced rates, although the pictures included more things than the portraits of the grown-ups, dolls, toys and pets. There's something about the bold, bare treatment of this face that leaves a strong impression of a particular person. But just in case the parents didn't recognise that butter wouldn't melt in the mouth look, there's his best suit to prove it's their son, and his mongrel dog with telltale patches of light fur. The dogs and cats which got into these paintings of children were painted feature by feature in the same meticulous way as their owners and usually came out looking like fierce comedians somewhat larger than life, stiff and four square like the children themselves. Profile painting was the easiest as well as the cheapest. The artist would make small variations to his basic formula to fit the character of the child. Here the quiff of hair that won't sit down. The bird is probably the artist's trademark. There was also a big trade in mourning pictures, painted almost always by women for some reason. They followed a rigid convention of weeping willows, handsome urns and depersonalised mourners. They were hung on the parlour walls and often took the place of real tombstones, being cheaper and easier to do. Sometimes they were prepared long before they were needed, the name or names being added later as required. They were cheap reminders of the dear departed, and while paying the family's respects to the dead, invoked harmless endure and wealth. So from childhood to the grave, the Limmers chronicled the lives of these pioneer Americans, a tough, self-sufficient, pious and nonconformist people. As well as records of themselves and of their property, they would also commission religious paintings, not, of course, of the Holy Family or Saints, which would be considered much too popish, but of Bible stories which preached good neighbourliness, such as this early strip cartoon of the Good Samaritan, complete with text. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. And they stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite came and looked at him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan came where he was and had compassion on him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
The nearest approach to a saint in the art of American folk painters is the Quaker William Penn. He's painted over and over again, particularly by Edward Hicks, himself a Quaker, and one of the few of these is well known. Most of them never signed their work, and their identities are lost. Hicks often painted Penn's grave at Jordan's in Buckinghamshire, although he'd never been to England himself. Hicks, to my mind, is the best of these folk painters. His favorite subject was the Peaceable Kingdom, a pious idyll illustrating Isaiah chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and young lion and the fattening together, and a little child shall lead them. And always in the background on the left-hand side is William Penn signing his treaty with the Indians. Hicks must have painted nearly a hundred versions of this vision of the promised land, painting as if the biblical prophecy had at last come true in Pennsylvania. It's one of the simplest and purest communications of faith in the history of art. To my mind, a society gets the art it deserves. The folk art of America was an art of the people, made by the people for the people, and it does them proud.